Uh, welcome to Patrick Daniels' thesis defense. Thank you for coming. Uh, first, give a little introduction. Uh, so Patrick graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in biology from the University of San Francisco. And before coming to Moss Landing, he spent time in the Gilly Lab at Hopkins Marine Station. And it was in researching squid that he actually got interested in physical oceanography, seeing the impacts of oxygen minimum zones and currents in the, in the Gulf of California. And um, when he came to MLML, he didn't actually apply to work with me specifically. I think he applied to work with a uh, physical oceanographer to be determined. Uh, but <laughs> he, uh, after talking with him, I realized he'd be a, a great fit for the lab. And luckily, Patrick came. And uh, he's been a great contributor to the lab. He's uh, contributed a lot to my classes and physical oceanography and, and data analysis, contributed a lot of material and effort. Um, since his time here, he's accomplished a lot. He's received a MLML Scholar Award, a Myers, uh, Myers Trust Award. And even though he's graduating, uh, luckily we'll still have him as a colleague down the street. Uh, he'll be uh, continuing work as a data manager in the Senkus office in Ambari. And I think you'll see from his presentation uh, why he's uh, well suited for that position. So um, without further ado, I'll let Patrick uh, tell you about his thesis. For, for coming out today. Um, so uh, the title of my talk is Contributions in wave and Wind and Wave-Induced Transport to Nearshore Phytoplankton Variability in Northern California. Um, so I'll start with just giving a, a sort of introduction on, on different scales of variability in phytoplankton. And this will set up um, sort of what motivates some of my research. Uh, then, I, then I have to give a little bit of background on, on wind and wave interactions and sort of cover some of the physics. Um, and then I'll go into sort of my project, which is, is looking at some, some time series analysis of, of nearshore phytoplankton, um, and then uh, looking at a particle tracking model that I developed to, uh, to answer some, some questions that sort of came out of that analysis. And then we'll have a, a hopefully time for a brief discussion and, and questions. Um, so I just want to start uh, with sort of get, getting everyone on the, on the same page and thinking about phytoplankton. Um, this is sort of a, a, a gross oversimplification of, of the marine food web, but, but really what I want to sort of hammer home is, is the importance of, of the link of phytoplankton at the base of the food chain. Um, and that's through uh, photosynthesis, uh, photosynthesis, so the fixing of, of uh, uh, carbon dioxide into complex carbohydrates, uh, and basically harvesting the energy from the sun, uh, which works its way basically up the trophic level as things eat phytoplankton, uh, and then things eat the things that eat the things, and so forth. Um, and in a lot of ways, that, that affects us uh, both directly as eventually it makes its way up to things that we as humans eat or are generally interested in. And so um, I sort of have to introduce the topic of, of how we actually measure phytoplankton. Um, these are four illustrations of, of some common species we see in the bay here. And they really only represent four of, of hundreds of different species. Um, but uh, so, so you have to sort of think about, uh, of, again, how we measure these things. Um, you, could, you could go out and collect water, put it under a microscope, and, and count these things. Uh, but that's, it's fairly tedious. And, and these things are constantly changing over space and time. And, and that's a whole area of research that I'm, I'm basically going to ignore. Um, and so sort of my solution is, is to approximate that using chlorophyll. So chlorophyll is, is the photosynthetic pigment that, that's in plants. It's in, uh, in phytoplankton and marine algaes. Um, and so we can measure this uh, pretty reliably, both using uh, looking at the color of the ocean from satellites, and then um, also looking at the fluorescent properties of, of chlorophyll using in situ sensors, meaning sensors in the water. And so this is what that looks like. This is um, a, a figure from a, a paper by Messi and Chavez showing sort of the mean distribution of chlorophyll in, uh, in, in sort of over, over the whole globe or, or parts of the globe. And so um, the colors here represent chlorophyll concentration. The, the warm colors at the top uh, mean are, are areas where we have high, high values of, of chlorophyll. The, the cold areas are, are low values. And it's worth noting this is on a logarithmic scale. So the difference between really red and slightly less red is actually larger than the difference between yellow and blue 
And so what stands out here, uh, sort of the, the obvious patterns that I wanted to point out are along the coasts, we have lots of areas of, of high phytoplankton or, or chlorophyll. Um, and I specifically wanted to highlight sort of these four areas, um, which are called eastern boundary currents. So the, the California current system, which runs basically from British Columbia down to Baja, the Peruvian current system, uh, which is sort of northern Chile, uh, Chile up to Ecuador, northern Peru, um, the Canary current, and then the Benguela currents off of Africa. Um, and these, are, these uh, current systems are of particular interest because of, um, of some, some physical properties that, that they have. Um, they're called eastern boundary currents, which, as the name suggests, they're on the eastern edge of, of ocean basins. So in California and Peru, they're on the eastern edge of the Pacific Ocean. Here, they're on the eastern edge of the Atlantic. Um, and they're pretty remarkable. Uh, so, so they only make up a, a, about less than 2% than of the, the global ocean waters, but are account, uh, uh, sort of accountable for around 7% of the, the global primary productivity in the, in the whole ocean, and around 20% of the global marine take in fish. So, you can say that these areas are, are particularly important, uh, not only for ecology, but also for, for sort of that, that human interaction with the ocean. And so to sort of get at some of the physical characteristics, they tend to be areas of strong winds where the winds are moving parallel to the coast, um, which leads to a process called coastal upwelling, um, which I'll get into. Um, and sort of before I jump into coastal upwelling, I wanted to give um, sort of a, a just an overview of, of the sort of frame of reference that, I, um, that I'll be talking about. So when I say a longshore in terms of wind or current, um, I'm, I'm meaning, I'm basically saying things that are happening parallel to the coastline. Um, and then when I say onshore, I'm talking about processes that are, are moving towards or away from the coastline. And then the, uh, the convention I'm using is, is a negative a longshore vector um, is something that's moving basically to, to the equator in the, uh, or southward in, in the California current system. And then onshore is a, 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 a positive vector would be something moving towards the coast. Um, and then one other term I just wanted to define real quick uh, is wind stress, which is denoted by this little lowercase t, the tau signal uh, um, symbol. And this is really just the, a, a way to, to sort of approximate how wind uh, affects the, the, the surface of the ocean. So it's how wind sort of drags along the top of the ocean. Um, and so thinking about our California current system, uh, we have these alongshore winds that are sort of seasonally persistent um, and sort of define our, our region. And what happens is the alongshore wind stress drags water along the coastline. And as it does that, because of the rotation of the Earth, um, that water gets deflected offshore. And this is, this is a response to the, the Coriolis force. Um, and so as the water gets deflected offshore or away from the coast, it drags up cold, nutrient-rich water near the coastline with it. And so thinking about this in three dimensions, here's that alongshore wind stress. It's dragging along surface water and sort of pulls it offshore. And as it does that, cold, nutrient-rich water uh, from depth gets pulled up near the coastline. And this is, uh, this is that process of coastal upwelling. And so um, the reason I, I keep saying cold, nutrient-rich is, is that nutrients and sunlight are, are basically the, we can think of them broadly as sort of these two modulators of phytoplankton growth. So it's the availability or the lack of availability of either of these things that we can sort of think of as, as controlling that growth. And so to think about this on, a, on a, an annual scale, um, this is sort of a complicated figure, but um, what I, what I, I'll sort of walk you through it. On, on the x-axis, we have uh, the month of the year. Um, and then on the y-axis, it's just the general abundance of, of a couple of different things. And so the first thing I want to point out are these green circles, which are, um, uh, represent nutrients. These are nitrate values. And this is... Um, and, and so we see this pattern of, of sort of doming and, and uh, uh, the, the nitrate values coming up in the early spring and then sort of tailing off as the summer goes on. Um, so uh, that's that coastal upwelling signal that we, we, we just showed. Um, so the, uh, the yellow line here represents the sunlight or availability of, of light for, for phytoplankton. Um, and as you can see, 
again, not surprisingly, as the days get longer and the water clarity clears out as we have fewer large storms, um, there's more sunlight available for phytoplankton. And then so finally, the response to that is this, this little green dot here. This, this is showing the, how, how phytoplankton or, or primary production uh, increases throughout the season. And you can see it sort of slightly tails the response of these two things. Um, and so the point I, I guess I want to, to make here is that um, on an annual scale, thinking about things in terms of seasons, months, and, and years, there is a, a pretty clear pattern um, related to upwelling. But now I want to sort of uh, shift the focus to thinking about spatial variability. So this is a, an image of, um, of ocean color as measured from, from the VIRS satellite. Uh, it's a composite image, so it's a bunch of images are, are sort of stitched together and then projected onto a map. And what you can see is that at any given point, there's a lot of structure to, um, to, to uh, the phytoplankton. There's all of these eddies and, and uh, um, persistent structures. So another way to look at that is to actually map the chlorophyll. Um, so, so this is the ocean color. And then now we're actually looking at chlorophyll values here. And this is similar to the, the plot we saw earlier where the hot colors are high um, high chlorophyll values and then the, the colder colors are low values. And again, what I, what I want to point out is that um, at this scale, there's still a lot of structure to the variability. So it sort of almost looks fractal in a lot of ways. There's, um, there's all sorts of different features. You can see the sort of Columbia River plume. And, uh, and then another thing worth pointing out is that near the coastline, if you sort of squint, you can see it's a really dark red. It's basically the peaked, uh, peaked values. So it's there's some really high chlorophyll near the coastline. Um, so now we're, we're going to zoom in. So now we're looking at central and sort of the, the beginnings of Northern California. This is uh, data from, from CWIFS, another, or, or MODIS, excuse me, another uh, chlorophyll uh, satellite, measuring satellite from June 11th in 2010. And again, at this scale, we see lots of structure, um, but there's also a ton of spatial variability. We have um, lots of chlorophyll, in this case, in the Monterey Bay. But if we go south off of Point, uh, Point Sur, there's not really a lot going on. Um, there's sort of these big eddies. We want to zoom in further now. So now we're going to zoom in uh, sort of north of Point Reyes. And so I think we've, zooming in here, we've sort of reached the, the limits of what we can tell from satellites. Um, our resolution sort of becomes pixely. It's trying to resolve things on the coastline, but I'm not sure how much anyone would really trust these values. Um, and, and so if we want to think about processes, with this, uh, with satellites, we can uh, at really at best get daily res resolution. Um, but as I'll show here, this is a, from two days later. Um, this data is really susceptible to cloud cover. So, so satellites can, we sort of, again, at, at this scale, reach the, the limits. Um, and so now I just want to sort of bring up why we care um, and why I'm sort of motivated to think about things at, at these fine scales. Uh, so for one thing, um, we can think about near the, near the coastline, uh, chlorophyll as subsidy for, for intertidal and subtidal animals. So, so in that case, um, these are the, it provides, again, the, the sort of basic food um, for things that grow in, near the coastline. Uh, understanding sort of the physical drivers are really important for thinking about larval dispersion, uh, transport of, of, um, of plankton near the coast. Uh, you can also get into harmful algal blooms and, and mariculture and, and sort of things that start to affect humans as well. Um, so I want to zoom in even closer. Um, so now, instead of looking at satellite data, we're looking at um, in situ measurements of, of chlorophyll. And these are taken from a pump house right up here um, in Horseshoe Cove off of uh, the Bodega Headland. Uh, and so the water gets pumped off of there, and it, pump, it gets pumped into the marine lab, and then run through some sensors, which measure chlorophyll um, every 15 minutes. And so at this scale, we can start to see some real structure uh, that we miss at, at looking at a daily scale. So, so at, uh, looking at things in terms of hours, um, we see these large peaks. Um, I, I plotted up just the daily mean that would to sort of mimic what we might be able to see from a satellite. And you'd see that on this day, where it was cloudy, we basically missed this whole structure um, of variability. And so 
this is sort of the scale that I've, I've been interested in, and particularly asking what, what are sort of the physical mechanisms that drive these, these up and down uh, patterns in near shore phytoplankton variability. Um, and, and sort of how can we, how can we measure these things and, and test them? Um, and so uh, I've been looking at some intertidal uh, chlorophyll data. This is that same time period that I was showing um, uh, using the, the, both the satellites and then the, um, the, pump, the shore station data. Um, and there was a great paper by uh, McPhee Shaw et al. In, in 2011, which sort of posited um, a mechanism for explaining some of this variability. Um, and that was based on the, the observations that if you plot, um, I should explain what this is. This is a significant wave height. So this is the, how big the waves are offshore. And if you sort of overlap that with some of this nearshore variability, you can see that there's areas where there seems to be a really strong correlation, uh, certainly here and in these spots. But there's also areas where, where there isn't a really a strong correlation. And so they proposed a mechanism of, of wave-induced transport um, where, whereby waves are pushing phytoplankton into the near shore uh, uh, as a dominant form of onshore trans, uh, transport into sort of a convergent zone where phytoplankton could be sort of trapped in these really uh, short latency events, which, which leads to these high peaks in chlorophyll. And so just to explain what Stokes drift is or, or wave-induced transport, um, it was first described by George Gabriel Stokes uh, over 100 years ago. Um, and, and really all I want to get across is it's a net movement of water that, hap that occurs from, from in the direction of wave propagation. So normally we don't think of, um, of water or waves as imparting any, any net momentum to the water, um, but there actually is a little bit. And so this is sort of a process. Um, this is it, The red asterisk here is a water po um, a particle. It, it runs in an orbit as the, as the wave propagates across. And because the velocity, the horizontal velocity, is a little bit higher at the top of the orbit than it is at the bottom, there's a slight net movement in the direction of the wave. And so um, I guess the other, the other thing I want to sort of get out of this is that there's, or, no, or sort of illustrate is that there's this pattern of exponential decay in the size of this orbit as you go depth, uh, down. And so this um, sort of supports the notion that, that this could be a, a strong form of transport near the surface uh, where you have waves. And so real quickly, I just want to sort of talk about how we measure waves. Um, we can generally think of waves in terms of these bulk parameters, like significant wave height that I just showed, which is we can just sort of think of it as, as sort of the size of the wave. The, the peak period is sort of the time in between peaks as the waves propagate, and then the direction that the waves are, are actually moving. Um, and we measure waves using these buoys like this wave riding buoy where they sort of sit on top of the ocean. They're, they're more down to this, the, the bottom. And then they just kind of bob up and down. And we can translate that, that sort of up and down momentum or um, movement into an elevation. And then we can sort of run some statistics to generally describe what's happening. And these are really useful sort of in day-to-day -day, um, uh, descriptions of waves. But how do we describe a complex sea state with just three values? And so this is sort of where the limitations of thinking of waves in terms of these bulk parameters are, are met. Um, because there's a lot going on here. There's, there's white caps and, and stuff from wind. There's a likely swell that's coming through that, that's coming from, from elsewhere. Um, and so we need sort of more complex descriptors of this. And so the solution is to look at the, the wave spectra, um, which I won't get too, too far into the details of. But in this case, we just want to think of it as, as basically um, the energy at different periods or frequencies. And so we can think of swell as those really long waves as uh, being sort of at the top here with having a long period. And then these wind waves, um, which are sort of things that, that occur at shorter periods. Um, and so you can calculate these from the, the elevations. And these are actually used to calculate those bulk parameters. Um, so here's some actual uh, wave spectral data. This is from the, the buoy right off of Hopkins last night when there was a, a little bit of a storm coming in. 
So on the y-axis, we just have energy. Uh, we don't really need to worry about the units too much. Um, on the x-axis, we have the period, or the if you wanted to think of it in terms of frequency, it would be the inverse of that. Um, but what I want to sort of pull out is there's this area where, where we sort of think of that as swell, generally around larger than, longer than 10 seconds. And we can sort of think of this as being generated remotely often in storms um, that are not local. And then, uh, and then we have the rest of this energy, which is in these shorter periods, um, which we think of as generally just wind waves or, or, or processes that are, that are, or energy that's generated locally. Um, and so now with, with these, we can start to think about how to sort of describe more complex sea states. Um, the other thing we, we have to sort of consider are the directional spectrum. Um, so, so in the same way that energy is spread out over uh, different periods, um, at these different periods, uh, the direction of the waves can, can differ. And so this is a, a polar plot. They're a little difficult to sort of understand sight and scene, but um, this is showing the, the cardinal direction of where the waves are coming from. And then the rings around correspond to the period. So this is that long period near the center, and then the short period uh, sort of wind processes on the outside. And then the color represents the, uh, the energy density. Um, and so in this case, we can see as this, this storm uh, came in last night, there's sort of a shift in the energy to more into these longer, um, longer period uh, uh, frequencies. And so including all of this information around the, the direction and the, um, the spectrum uh, is really important, particularly in calculating Stokes drift. There's some, some pretty interesting active research in that area. Um, but it's also a great way to sort of visualize waves, um, especially over time. So this is what's called a mountain plot. Um, on the y-axis, we have the day of the month. So this is uh, for May of 2009. The, uh, each of these little mountains is proportional to the, the energy density. Um, and then on the bottom here, we have the period or the frequency. And the long period stuff is on the left, and the short period stuff is on the right. And so looking at this, we can see periods where you have um, sort of these long, uh, little bit of energy in the sort of the, the long period swell. And then a storm comes in, we have some swell, but then we also have some wind. Um, you can also plot the same thing. These are feather plots. So these, instead of showing the energy as these mountains, it's showing them as the magnitude of these, these arrows. And then the direction corresponds to that directional spectrum. Um, so thinking about this, now that we have a, a mechanism for, for thinking about waves in sort of a complex sea state, um, let's move back to those physical processes. Um, so we've sort of talked about two, and I'll, I'll bring up the third one. Um, we, I mentioned upwelling. So, so sort of in, in terms of what are the, the physical drivers that are, that are driving nearshore phytoplankton variability? Is it upwelling? Are we seeing in situ growth from, from the introduction of, of nutrients and, and sunlight? Is it evection? I mean, it's possible that a big plume of phytoplankton is basically just passing by um, as, uh, as we're observing. Or is it this accumulation process where, where maybe phytoplankton are trapped in the near shore related to waves? Or likely some combination. And so um, this is sort of it's finally getting at some of the, the actual uh, research topics that I'm interested in. This is sort of um, the first question I want to ask is, can I tease apart the different physical mechanisms that drive that near shore phytoplankton variability? And particularly looking at those, those um, events where we have really high uh, nearshore chlorophyll. Um, and then after that, I want to see if I can sort of model the origins of the water um, to sort of try and create a more complete picture of what's going on. But sort of starting off, we'll, we'll just sort of focus on this first question. And then I just want to sort of reorient again with this conceptual model. Um, so in, in this case, we're, we're thinking about these, these arrows as being onshore transport primarily from Stokes drift or, or the wave-induced transport. And as they sort of bunch up on the shoreline, they create a convergence zone. Um, oops, I got ahead of myself. Uh, so this onshore, uh, onshore transport of phytoplankton and then a sort of convergence zone forming to trap things near shore. Um, 
So getting into some of the data, this was really a project of, of lots of data. Um, so I'm going to sort of step through the different data that I looked at. Um, the first thing is I looked at these uh, in intertidal um, chlorophyll and temperature time series that were collected by Krenna Nielsen's group, uh, formerly at Sonoma State, but now at San Francisco State. And these were deployed annually, and they ran um, some calibrations on them. So they're a really interesting data set. Um, I also looked at the shore station data that's coming in from the pump house at, at Bodega Marine Labs of UC Davis, uh, which has some chlorophyll data, temperature, salinity, and, and wind. Um, and then the other thing I looked at sort of in the near shore is this MOPS model, which is a, a, it's a wave model that uses data from offshore and propagates it forward. So it's a way for us to basically, without having sensors here, estimate um, the wave conditions in the nearshore environment. Um, and then so now stepping offshore a little bit, um, I used uh, some surface current data from the high frequency radars. Um, and really all this, and I, I just took some spatial uh, averages there of, of sort of an inner, an inner box, a mid box, and an outer box. Um, and this is really just a measure of the surface currents. Um, and then I looked at some MET data, some wind wave and temperature data from this uh, National Data Buoy Center buoy. And then finally, I looked at some uh, wave data from uh, this CDIP buoy, one of those little wave riding ones that I showed earlier, which also has temperature. And I, I apologize for not making the map big enough. Um, but the, the point that I, I guess to distinguish between these is that this one is, is is pretty far offshore, off of the shelf, and this one is over the shelf. Um, so now, um, actually looking at some of the data, this is one year of that intertidal chlorophyll deployment. Um, and so I went through, and I, and I wanted to, to sort of create a, a, a metric to pull out each of these little um, peaks. And so I, I sort of just used a general threshold of the mean of the entire deployment plus one standard deviation. Um, and so when you draw a line across there, you can sort of pull out the peaks from there um, as, as events. And so I did that for five years of, of intertidal data, um, which, which ended up in, in 41 of these events. Um, and so if you look at the, the seasonal distribution of those, um, where this is the number of events on the y-axis and then the, the month on the x-axis, we see it, it, it generally follows that, that same pattern that we saw at the larger scale of, um, of a longshore transport and upwelling, where we have this ramping up in, in sort of late spring and early summer. Um, and then across the years, there wasn't really any variability in terms of the number of events. Um, and then when possible, I tried to compare this intertidal time series with the, uh, the data from the Bodega Marine Lab shore station. Um, and there were 21 events where I was able to do that. And they're, they're pretty well correlated, which, um, which gives me confidence that this isn't just some artifact of, of putting a pluromater in, in the inner tidal. Um, and so from there, uh, for each of those events, I uh, aggregated 97 hours of, uh, before uh, the data and so those are sort of illustrated here. So I collected all of the data uh, 97 hours before each of the events um, and sort of put those into a, a conditional average or a, a sort of idealized state um, where, where either I use the mean or the median depending on the distribution of the data. Um, and the, oops, sorry. And then I did the same thing for all of those physical parameters. So I, I created these sort of conditional states. And so this is what that looks like. Um, sort of smoothed up a little bit. Um, so this is the median intertidal chlorophyll here. And the nice thing about this is now we can start to look at some of the structure of, the, the, um, of this curve. Um, so I plotted up the, the sort of standard deviation first of, of chlorophyll uh, used to um, calculate this conditional average. And that just shows that there's a lot more variability starting in about 40 hours. The other thing I'm plotting here on the um, I should explain the x-axis. <laughs> the um, so sorry, this is the x-axis is our hours before the peak chlorophyll. So this is when we zero is when we saw those peaks um, on that time series, and then this is the the sort of hours preceding that. 
And so the last thing I'm showing here are, is the, uh, the time derivative of chlorophyll. So it's basically the rate of change of this curve here. And the interesting thing is we see this sort of maximum slope at, um, at about 13 hours. And so I think with this you can ask the question, um, well, are we just seeing growth? Is this just in situ growth? And so the way I, I thought about this is, is to look at sort of the, the compounding rates of this curve, um, which, which I'm sort of calling an accumulation rate. So since this is an in situ sensor, um, this curve here, or, or the time uh, it takes for, um, for this, the amplitude to, to rise, should be a function of, of both growth flux, meaning things moving in and out of the, the, the sensor um, view, and then mortality, so whatever is being consumed there. And so using that, I, I, I just looked at the, the sort of compounding rates of, uh, of chlorophyll, and you get this accumulation rate of about uh, 0.84 uh, per day, which is, is a 19-hour doubling, which is a, a pretty reasonable, it's sort of a high uh, growth, growth rate if you were just to um, sort of measure that in the lab. But I wanted to think about what about mortality, how big is this term? Um, so I went to the literature, um, and there's a, a meta review of, of, um, of these mortality and, and growth, exper growth rate experiments. And I pulled out a value for uh, mortality for in the coastal uh, region. And so I, if I subtract that out from our, our daily rate, um, we get a doubling time of about 13.4 13, 13 hours. And so this is well above sort of growth rates that we'd expect um, from just the introduction of nutrients. Um, and there's also uh, sort of referencing those from the literature. There's the growth rates that were reported in this, this meta-analysis. So I think this is a, a pretty good evidence that there's at least some combination of, of growth and then also flux, so accumulation or, or things moving in uh, to the area. And so starting to look at some of the conditional states of, of physical drivers, um, now, again, we have chlorophyll in the top. Um, this is, again, the peak at zero hours. But now we're showing, I'm showing the alongshore wind stress um, here in the blue trace uh, in this, the blue solid line. And there's sort of two takeaways I, I want to pull out of this. One, that there's this negative correlation. So as we, we see a ramping up of this, alongshore wind stress um, sort of towards the equator or, or southward. Um, we also see a ramping up of chlorophyll. Um, but the, the time scales are, are slightly different. Um, the wind seems to start at about 40 hours, whereas chlorophyll, chlorophyll maybe starts there but really ramps up at around 20 hours. And I'll look a little more closely at this uh, in a sec. Um, so now uh, I'm plotting the significant wave height, so it's that bulk parameter of, of sort of the, the size of the waves. Um, and I'm showing you the wave height from both buoys, the, the C-dip, that offshore buoy, and then the, the other buoy, the NDBC buoy that was on the shelf. Um, and again, a similar pattern. It's, it's, it's pretty well correlated with, um, with significant wave, uh, excuse me, with the chlorophyll. But what I want to pull out of this is that both buoys uh, show a, a similar response, which sort of lends, lends uh, uh, I, think you, I think we can uh, rely on the assumption now that this is, in this area, there's a pretty spatially uniform uh, wave climate, meaning that um, buoys that are, are measuring things uh, hundreds of miles apart are, are basically showing the same response. Okay, so now I'm showing the um, Stokes drift here. And so this is, a little complicated, so first I just want to show, uh, I want people to sort of focus in on the bottom trace here. So in orange, the solid orange line is the um, alongshore transport um, from Stokes Drift measured offshore. And so this is measured from the offshore wave buoys. And we see a similar pattern that sort of mimics that um, alongshore uh, wind, wind stress of, of this increased southernward um, component. And again, it's correlated with the offshore uh, um, chlorophyll. Or excuse me, it's, it's correlated with the, the nearshore chlorophyll. Um, and then the other, the other thing to focus in on is calculating Stokes drift from that, the MOPS model, which is a sort of estimate of nearshore wave energy. Um, we see that, that is all, trans, uh, all of the energy there or transport is moved into an onshore component. 
So in the blue line, we're, we're now looking at, at the transport moving towards the coast. Um, and so to sort of explain that, I have to bring up the point that waves refract as they move closer, um, as they move over shallower water. Um, and so the, the, the MOPS model in this case is, is I think, uh, basically supporting the idea that what we're seeing in, in the alongshore component offshore will eventually work into an onshore component in the nearshore. And so um, finally, I'm going to show the, the surface currents here. Um, it looks a little complicated, but I just want to sort of pull out two things. First is that there, we see a similar pattern. There's an increase in this alongshore surface currents. Um, and this makes sense. These uh, surface currents are, are generally dominated over the shelf by, uh, by wind. Um, so that's not surprising. And then the other thing is we don't, uh, we don't see like a general pattern of that, that offshore Ekman transport that you might think from, from an upflowing scenario. Um, so now if we compare uh, wind stress and Stokes drift on the same axis or uh, in a regression, we start to get it at, at some of the mechanisms here. And this is sort of uh, prefaced with asking the question, is, it, is this uh, variability from wind or waves? Um, and so what we see here is that there's a strong correlation between wind stress, uh, the, the magnitude of wind stress and the magnitude of Stokes drift. Um, and this is compelling because this is sort of the first piece of evidence in, in, in thinking about how wind and wave interactions uh, could possibly explain this process. Um, and, so, and so I think what we're seeing here is wind stress is imparting energy um, into the wave spectra, um, which will increase Stokes drift. Um, and so we can think of this as, as the wind sort of contributing to that, that wind wave sort of tail end of those spectrum. Um, and so, so this is sort of an indirect effect on Stokes or on, on sort of transport from, from wind. And so um, sort of looking at the time course, this is sort of all the time before 40 hours. It's sort of just ambient conditions. And then from 40 to 20, 24 hours, there's a real ramping up in wind stress, uh, which is followed with an increase in Stokes drift. And then between 20, uh, 20 hours and sort of the peak, which is when we, we have sort of the strongest peaking, uh, strongest uh, rate of rise in chlorophyll, um, it sort of starts to, to mellow off. Um, and just to show that this is not just a, a function of, of, or an artifact of, of the average state, this is all the raw data for those, those time periods. And, and so these correlations still stand up there. Um, and so thinking about that, with, sort of with that in mind, um, I wanted to just bring up a sort of simplistic way to think about the wave direction. Um, and so I'm showing here the uh, alongshore wind stress. So as it becomes more negative, um, this is kind of a strange orientation, but this is that stronger negative uh, alongshore wind stress. So it's blowing harder to the south. Um, and then this is wave height on the y-axis. And so we see that as, as we get the stronger uh, alongshore wind stress, we get larger waves. Um, and then if we actually look at some of the, the wave directions, um, they're largely coherent, meaning they're, they're, they're moving in the same direction. Um, and I think this will reinforce the idea that, that wind is contributing to, to Stokes drift um, in that in, in our scenario here, they're almost always uh, propagating in the same direction, at least offshore. And so, um, Lastly, I, I, I plotted, I'm plotting up the, that Stokes drift calculated from, uh, uh, from the nearshore wave model, the MOPS model, um, and then against that, that chlorophyll value. And here we can see sort of before 24 hours, it's just sort of um, there's, there's not really any signal. But then uh, 24 hours before the peak, you see this real uh, sharp increase. And so this is, I think, uh, uh, the sort of a good piece of evidence to support this model, um, short of actually having uh, wave measurements in the near shore. And so again, thinking about uh, what this model means, it means that what we're seeing offshore eventually bends uh, in and affects the near shore environment. And then uh, just that chlorophyll is correlated with, with the onshore Stokes drift. 
um, it's measured from that MOS model. And so just to recap some of these, um, wind, wave height, Stokes drift, they're all correlated with that, uh, with that, that chlor those chlorophyll values in the intertidal. Um, wind influences Stokes drift by, by transferring energy into the, the, the sort of wind wave part of the wave spectrum. Um, and that, um, and then we can use this, this MOPS model, this near shore estimate of, of wave energy to calculate Stokes drift, um, which sort of supports our conceptual model of near shore uh, convergence. And then the last thing I just want to mention, I'm not showing any of this analyses, but uh, I looked at all the temperature data and you don't see the, the signature of upwelling that, that you might expect to see, um, uh, which, which um, I should rephrase that. Uh, in, uh, there's some, some research from, from a student here uh, that was just published, uh, Ryan Manzier, who, who showed that um, in Monterey, down at the wharf, they, they would see these basically a cold signal um, with, with some of the peaks in chlorophyll, and that, that's sort of a, a general signal of upwelling. So we didn't see any of that signature um, here. And so sort of putting it back into this conceptual model, um, I think there's, there's evidence to support that this seems like a, a reasonable thing to look at. Um, again, that there's this... Uh, uh, increase ramping in, in onshore transport from, from waves, um, and those create a convergent layer, which would sort of lead to this rapid accumulation of phytoplankton. Um, just to support this further, uh, Tom Connolly, my advisor, uh, sort of took some of the, the parameterized conditions that I, that I, that I described uh, previously from, from the conditional average and uh, ran that in a 2D ROMS model. Um, and without getting too far into it, um, he was able to, to basically replicate what we were seeing. Um, so this is that onshore transport from waves in the red color, um, and then an offshore transport shown in the blue color. And so what stands out here is that we have this onshore at the surface. And what's really cool is um, in this idealized state, you can actually see the offshore um, transport from, from, from Ekman transport. So that's the upwelling signal. Um, so this is, I think, is a, a really compelling uh, avenue of, of investigation. Um, so sort of thinking about these in terms of just a, a thesis project, um, can I tease apart the different physical me me uh, mechanisms that drive near shore phytoplankton variability? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, and so, so now I want to sort of uh, see if I can model some of the origins of the water um, that ends up in the near shore. And I, I will preface this with um, sort of asking the question, where is this water coming from? Um, and this is also uh, to sort of think about, again, the spatial variability. Um, so this is a figure from uh, Hale and Larger in 2011. And what I want to sort of point you to is, is this region up here. This is Point Arena. Um, so we, this is. Uh, uh, Point Reyes and the Bodega Head right in here. Um, and Point Arena has been pretty well described as being an upwelling center, meaning that winds sort of, sort of push off of the edge of the coastline here, and there's a bunch of really, uh, uh, really strong upwelling here. And then um, what's really cool is you'll get these coastal jets that can, can bring a bunch of water from, from up here down, uh, down further south. And so I'm interested in sort of investigating if we can see any of that process. Or possibly um, there's another common process that, that's, that's been well described during relaxation conditions where water sort of sneaks up around from, from San Francisco around Point Reyes and into, into the Bodega region. Um, and again, uh, this is chlorophyll in, in, in the color. And they can see that that, that is correlated with some, some high chlorophyll events. Um, this is from a large air paper in, in 2006. And so to get at this, I uh, developed a particle tracking model um, using high-frequency radar, which uh, is sort of so shown here. It's a technology that from, from the shore we can map surface currents um, offshore. And I, I ran that model in reverse. So basically, sort of knowing where the water ends up, I can run it backwards to figure out where, um, where it came from. And then I wanted to include a, a Stokes drift term to see if, uh, how that affects the trajectory and if that's an important process to consider for these types of models. Um, 
And so this is sort of showing the general model domain here. Each of these dots represents a, a, a value, a node of where the surface currents are measured. Excuse me. Um, and the, the blue is showing where the data is really good, and then the red is showing where the, the sort of data quality starts to drop off. So there's some issues on the edge. And so what I ended up doing is just sort of chopping it off, um, and, and this becomes the actual model domain. And so the first um, iteration of the model that I ran, I'm going to show here. Um, and so to, to, oops, to, to sort of orient you, if I can bring that up again. Um, oops. Okay, there we go. Um, so to orient you here, uh, I'm going to release a particle right in the middle of these four dots. And uh, it, I had to assume some starting conditions, which is why it'll sort of go the, the wrong direction for a minute. But then it corrects itself. And so you'll see these four red dots around the particle. So those are the velocities that are, are, are forcing the model. Um, so let me actually run it here. I'll speed it up a little bit. And so this is, uh, this is the basic idea. Um, so we can use these. Uh, high frequency radar measured surface currents, and then we can drop a bunch of particles in there and sort of figure out where they go. Um, and so when you do that, you end up getting uh, sort of trajectories like this. So I seeded the particles here, and I ran them in reverse, and they ended up up here basically exiting the model domain. And so for every um, Near shore event, I would use that uh, those those high chlorophyll events as um, times to seed the model, and so uh, and then for each of those, I ran the model for um, uh, using just the the radar measured surface currents, and then also using surface currents with um, including a Stokes drift term, and so that's what we'll see in this animation here. Uh, the the red particle is the um, the particle track with which includes Stokes drift, and the blue is just the, the um, high frequency radar. And so they sort of meander. You can see the time. This is the hours before the peak, and they sort of meander their way up and and out of the oops out of the domain. Um, and so I can do that for so I did that for uh, thirty. 34 different events uh, where, where the data was good. And they sort of broadly broke out into two categories. Um, the, the vast majority of the, the water, in this case, originated from the north, um, which is what we're seeing here. Uh, and then there were eight events where the water um, originated from the south and sort of meandered and, and worked its way down. And so in these figures, um, the uh, tracks without Stokes drift are the solid, the solid lines. And then the tracks, which include Stokes drift, are, are the, the dash lines. Um, and sort of my, my takeaway from, from this scenario is that uh, including Stokes drift didn't change the, the, the origin of where the water masses came from. It just came, changed the, the time course, um, basically how long it took them to basically e exit the model domain. And that's, again, because of that, highly, that high coherence between the direction of the wind and the waves. Um, and so, so in this case, the waves were, were acting to reinforce the, the surface currents that are um, uh, largely driven by, by wind. And then, um, and then on these sort of eight uh, other um, trajectories, the Stokes drift uh, components actually were uh, significantly different sort of from, from the, just the, the, the radar. Um, and I think that's because these sort of represent maybe a different system that just sort of got, got captured in that threshold that I used. Um, and so these, these are really interesting. I just didn't quite get enough of them to, to really dig into uh, what's going on. Um, so, so this plot here is, is showing hours before peak. So that's basically the start time of the model. And then it's showing this, the spread in, in, kilometer, in kilometers between um, the, the particle position run with uh, Stokes drift, including a Stokes drift term. Um, and so, so basically what we see is there's just sort of a straight general linear uh, um, spread from uh, uh, 
when, when you include the Stokes drift term. Um, and I think there are definitely conditions where including that term doesn't matter at all um, in conditions where it might matter a lot. Um, and so sort of bringing it all together here, um, I want to wrap this up and sort of put it into a three-step process. And so this is sort of how my conceptual idea of, of what I've, of that nearshore phytoplankton variability has, has sort of come out in, in my mind. Um, first, there's this upwelling process that we can't ignore. I mean, this is really a, a, a signature of, of the, the, the California current. And so what I think is happening is we're seeing waters that are originating from, from Point Arena um, with uh, that upwelling center getting brought down off the coast of Bodega. Um, and then as they do that, the winds are reinforcing Stokes Drift by, uh, by uh, uh, reinforcing sort of the wind-wave interactions, um, which leads to stronger onshore transport, which then uh, sort of sets up this scenario where we have Stokes Drift pushing phytoplankton onshore, which leads to these rapid accumulations in, in that nearshore uh, phytoplankton signal. And so um, I just wanted to sort of plot or, 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 or plug that uh, after spending a year and a half developing my own model, um, I came across, a, a, there was a model published that sort of did everything I wanted to do, but slightly better. Um, so this is actually really exciting because now I can start to uh, sort of ask more questions around modeling some of the coastline interactions. Um, we can actually force this with different data, so using models or sort of longer range radar. And so we can actually start to maybe think about what's happening up here outside of the domain of the model. Um, and so that'll be sort of an area of, of of future work. Um, and so just to, to sort of recognize the, the tremendous amount of data, I wanted to sort of shout out these people and programs. Um, so the NDBC, which is a program run by, by NOAA, the National Data Buoy Center that runs those MET buoys, I think, and, and CDIP, these are like backbones of, of so many student projects. Uh, it's just such a tremendous data set. Um, and so I, I think we should all be grateful for these sort of collectively agreed uh, programs. Um, John Largera and, and Marcel Luskut at Bodega Marine Labs uh, maintain those, those radar up there and then some of the shore station data, um, and those were really helpful. Um, that intertidal time series uh, was run by Corinna Nielsen and then her, her former student, Anna uh, Packin, who at, when they were at Sonoma State. Um, and that's been a really, uh, it's a really great data set. It's, um, it's a noisy place to work, and, and I think they did a really fantastic job of producing good data out of it. I wanted to thank Fred, who's, who's out here, um, who sort of held it down for Sankus during this period and, uh, and made a lot of this data available. Um, and then I have had support from, from Tom's NSF, uh, as Tom mentioned, the, the MLML Scholar Award. Um, I had tuition covered through, my, through working at Stanford for a couple semesters, which was really helpful, and then a, a Myers Award. Um, so with that, I'll sort of take any questions. I know it's a lot. Yeah. Oh, the, the two physical oceanographers here are, of course, going to have. Yeah, Jim. And there's certainly circumstances where that's doable. You, you can have some waves propagating from the north and some winds yeah. going onshore. And, and have you tried to separate, tease it out using directionality? Yeah, so I, that was sort of my initial thought actually coming in, um, was I wanted to look at scenarios where you have big wind and, or, or big waves and no wind, or wind and waves in different directions. But just the, the properties of Northern California, it's, there's really just these um, sort of systematic uh, um, uh, southerly storms that'll come up. But almost most of the time, it's dominated by this alongshore wind. So I didn't really get into that. Um, it just, yeah. I think that, that other people are starting to look at that. And I think it's, it's a pretty compelling area. Um, and it would be really interesting, particularly when you start to think about particle tracking. 
So the HF uh, radar is going to measure uh, uh, the, the uh, Stokes curve? So that, that's, <laughs> it's sort of a, a, a controversial uh, part of, of the literature right now. Um, the sort of, the, uh, initially it was thought that, yeah, that, that it includes that, the drift in that term, but um, there's been some research uh, in the last five years, or well, the last couple of years that have shown that it's, it's only measuring a portion of that um, because, because you're, uh, the, the, basically the integration of the, the surface current is uh, how deep that integration is, is proportional to the, the frequency of the radar. Um, you're getting basically a filtered version of that. So, so there's sort of, um, the latest thought is that there, there's, or at least my reading of it, is that there, there is a very small uh, sort, of, um, sort of non or second order uh, component from Stokes drift, but it's largely an, an Eulerian measurement. The other thing, I, you kind of skipped pretty quickly over the fact that you didn't see any uh, offshore flow at the surface of, from the HF radars, and uh, but the Stokes drift is only like 20% of the speeds that you might uh, see. Yeah, so... Something special probably happens in the very near shore zone that yeah. overwhelms that. So, so if you actually go into the literature, um, there, there's a paper where... Um, uh, uh, Kerry Nichols deployed some ADCPs in right offshore in the in the nearshore environment during some of the periods I was looking at, and the um, there of course the the alongshore these coastal boundary layers that form are the dominant forms of transport. But if you look at the magnitude, um, there's times where Stokes drift is is actually uh, sort of at, at least at unity in terms of magnitude of the um, the alongshore transport. They didn't even bother to report the 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 onshore transport because it was so small from measured from the ADCPs. Um, so hopefully, I, I've, I've talked to her about looking at some of that data. I think that will add a compelling. Um, the movie you showed at the end where you had the rectangle full of dots and kind of showed the divergence yeah. happening a little bit uh, farther offshore than the Yeah. Wood. So you do see the convergence uh, from that. From the yeah, and so in this place, it's actually, um, there's these strong coastal jets here. And that's because uh, basically off of Point Arena, um, things either move offshore, off the shelf, or the, they get where, where the sort of California current takes over, or they get uh, sort of pushed down with the winds over the shelf. And so there is definitely a divergent flow there. Um, and it's, it's interesting. I, I just, it, it gets so complicated so fast to think about that. Um, So you, you took, uh, at one point, we were looking at the intertidal variability in chlorophyll, and you partitioned it out into some of the factors that might be influencing it. Can you, can you give me an estimate of what the percentage is for each of those components that might be affecting that variability? <laughs> yeah, I, I, no, I can't. Um, <laughs> and that's just because I, I think you could plug it into some multivariate model. Um, that I just wasn't sure that I have enough confidence in separating those out, as, as, as Tim was alluding to. They're, the pulling out, I mean, they're so autocorrelated, or they're so correlated, the wind and waves to each other, I'm, I'm not sure it would be terribly meaningful. Um, so I, I'm going to steer clear of that one. But do you think that the, the, the variability in the convection of uh, chlorophyll into the inner tidal is probably relatively small compared to the, some of the other factors that are, or do you think it's oh. actually high? No, I think it's high. Um, so I think, I think the way you could get into that is, um, and we've talked about this, oh, sorry, I'm going to step back a couple of slides, is um, you could sort of parameterize some of these things and include a biology component um, in a two-dimensional model. Um, but just looking at, I mean, e even if you assume sort of maximum growth, there's still a pretty significant flux um, from, from advection. So, yeah, I think it would take a sort of more data and, and maybe a, a more directed experiment to tease those things apart. What kind of observations would you do in a more directed experiment? Well, sure. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, there have been, there's, there's been a lot of research uh, of, of active projects in, in this area called the, the inner shelf, which um, is, has some really interesting wave and, and wind dynamics. 
Um, and so what there, there's a, an experiment going down in Southern California right now where they just crew, uh, deploy these arrays of, of bottom-mounted sensors so that can measure waves in the near shore. You can also measure those currents. Um, and so if you created an array of those moving offshore, you could basically have a, an alongshore gradient um, of, of measurements. I, I think that would be interesting. You could include fluorometers on those, so you could measure chlorophyll sort of discreetly. Um, and then you could actually have a biologist involved who could tell you something about what the critters are actually doing, um, which is probably pretty important. Um, I'm sort of willfully ignoring all of the, the behavior and physiology of phytoplankton uh, just to say that maybe they're slightly buoyant and, and they fluoresce. That was incredible, that talk you gave. Thank you very much. I've never seen such art <laughs> and science that yeah. you did it so nicely. Well, thanks. Thanks, Greg. That's really nice. This is, um, this is, it's, this is like kind of an exciting place to be. Um, there's, there's actually been a lot of, of stuff coming out now where thinking, people are thinking about Stokes Drift in, in sort of nearshore environments more. Um, especially as, as the sort of techniques for, for getting better wave data um, are, are coming around. And so it's not just uh, the sort of hardcore wave physics people who are thinking about it. There's, there's biologists and other sort of coastal oceanographers. Some, uh, some food here, so uh, feel free to hang out.